Uh, it continues tomorrow night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and Friday night. At what time? 7 p.m. But we're here by 6.59 for 7 p.m. And then the last two sessions will be this coming Saturday, Sabbath. The divine service will be at 11 a.m. start here at church. And then the final closing session will be this coming Saturday evening. At what time? 7 p.m. Very good. Uh, for the weeknight session, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday this week, there will be light snacks made available downstairs. I believe they'll be available from around 6.15 until a little bit before uh, 7 o'clock. Uh, so it, those, those snacks are available for you to eat, of course. Uh, but don't forget to be back up here in the sanctuary in time for the 7 p.m. start uh, for those evening presentations this week. If you have children that are with you for tonight or, or subsequent parts of the series, there are children's activities available uh, that are supervised downstairs. If you have any prayer requests, either tonight or any other time during the series, there are individuals here at the church that are part of our prayer ministry team. One is back here, um, Darlene. She's wearing a, a lanyard, and there's a few other. The lady in front of Darlene. Could you, Darlene and Kathy, could you please stand for us? So if you have a prayer request, oh, and Brother Gaspard as well, thank you. If you have a prayer request, either related to the series or a personal prayer request, please know that you can approach Sister Kathy, Darlene, or Brother Gaspard, and they will... Um, pray with you if you would like to be prayed with, or they will pray for you if that is your preference. And they are praying throughout the series as well every night and have been praying leading up to the start of the series. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, please remember to continue inviting people to the series. And the last comment is, uh, in a few minutes, Brother Earl is going to be doing the quiz for tonight based on last night's presentations. Two of the books that are available in response, correct responses to the quizzes, quiz questions. One is The Desire of Ages. The other is The Great Controversy. These are two of the books that our evangelist refers to so far every, in every session. And then the third option is a smaller book called Steps to Christ. So these are the three options that are available uh, when people provide correct answers to the quiz questions. All right, if you can please bow your heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, as, as the world continues about its business this evening, we are here. Father, we are here because your Holy Spirit has convicted each one of us to come tonight. And Lord, there are so many things that we could be doing tonight. I'm sure, represented by the people who are here, there are probably hundreds of different things we could be doing typically on a Sunday evening, but we are here. We are here, Father, because you are calling us to be here. And so we ask, Lord, that you will fill this place with your Holy Spirit. We pray, Father, for a double portion of the outpouring of your latter rain upon the speaker tonight. And may your Holy Spirit fill this place, stir within the heart, mind, and soul of each one who is here. Father, when, when the seminar is finished tonight, may we leave different in some way, closer to you in some way. Thank you so much, Father, for everyone who is here. Those who are fairly new in their relationship with you, we especially welcome. May they be blessed and may they experience your love. It is in the name of Jesus that we live, pray, and serve. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Elder Scotty, for that wonderful welcome. Um, once again, good evening. Good evening. Awesome. And we, I'm so thankful today it was such a lovely day. Aren't you? I, I mean, I was waking up this morning through rain and thunder and clouds, and I'm like, oh, Lord. But guess what? He made it better. So um, I'm inviting everyone to stand with us as we sing our opening song from hymn number 183. Um, this song is called I Will Sing of Jesus' Love. 
And as Christians, that's something that I hope that we do whenever, you know, wherever, whenever we are. So let's sing hymn number 183. a beautiful day. Amen? Amen. And I know you had a, a good time last night too, right? Amen. Except that you didn't get any gift. So um, I, did, I, I told myself, you know what, I have to, as the gift man, I can't keep all this gift. So I have to do a better job. Right? That's what I told myself. But I also told you that the, the questions were going to be harder. So you need to take notes, right? So, so uh, let me see, is there any first time visitor in our midst? Any first time visitor? I, okay, um, uh, Brother Scotty, could you give, give um, my, my friend, what's your name? <laughs> Doug, what, pardon me? Clayton, welcome Clayton. And I know that you will be truly blessed today. Okay, now, I, I have this, this gift here. This is a, a King James Bible, and, and it's a study Bible, right? And I need to give this, this Bible out for one of our, our, our members that brings out the most, the most uh, guests. So let me see... The hands of all will bring out 10, 10 members, 10 guests this evening. 10? What about, okay, I'm, I'm going to compromise a little bit. Seven? You brought one. You know what? Give, give my friend here, give, give him a, a gift for me, please. Give, give him a, a gift. You know, and uh, I, also, I also have... 
Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, so the, the Bible, the Bible is for, um, for the, the, the visitor who, who um, come, if you come the most night, you will get this Bible, the visitor, right? Any visitor that comes the most night will get this Bible, okay? Now I also have a book from this, 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 um, this, this, this author is Max Lucado. He's from New, New York and he's a bestseller writer. So I have this book for, for our for member who bring out the most visitors, okay? And it's, it's a very good book. So, you know, it will help you with your spiritual walk. So um, bring, your, bring your, your guests out so you can get this one, okay? Now, I don't have a lot of time, so let me go right into the quiz because I know you're anxious to hear them. Um, so the first one is, and I have three of them here. The first one is, what is the key concept discussed last night from, that's taken from Jeremiah 5 verse 22 and Acts 17 verse 26. And how does the, the Bible truth pertain to the plan of redemption and the sanctuary? I know it's a long question. So, okay, just focus on the first part of the question. You, you have the answer? Okay, okay. Okay, that's very good. So, the, so you hear the, the answer, right? So he's talking about the boundaries and about time, right? That's what, uh, that's, that's, the, that's what the answer is for, for question one. So give, give her a, a, a book for a present, please. Okay, so the second question is, listen up. Based on First Chronicles 12 verse 32, and John 15, verse 14. What are the three steps in, in getting to know God? The three steps that you need to, to do to get to know God. Okay. Pardon me? Yes, yes. So give her... Huh? Yeah, that's the three Yes. That's right. <laughs> All right. Okay, the last question is, how did, how did um, page, page um, three, 398 or 400, 401 from the book of The Great Controversy impact your art as you read about the 23... 100 days prophecy. Yes. Oh, yes. Did they, did you guys hear all of that? Okay. Um, it's very important. So I'm, I'm going to give her the mic so that. Could you come forward, please? And I need everyone to hear it because it's very important. Okay. Um, Go ahead, please. Yes. Yeah, so in... Um Great Controversy, page 398 to 401. Um, the theme was about unity in mind and spirit, that those who were awaiting Jesus' second coming based on the prophecy of the 2300-day prophecy um, in Daniel, um, they expected Jesus to come in 1844. But though Jesus did not come at that time, uh, the people were united um, in mind and spirit, and they were in harmony um, and they had one faith and one blessed hope that 
acted as a shield um, against Satan's darts. And it also foretold um, uh, that Christ was our first fruit. So it was connecting the Old Testament feasts about the first fruits, okay. um, that Jesus was our first fruit, and that the rest who are, are going to be raised at his second coming, that those will be the other fruits okay. after him. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Let's continue to um, you know, take notes of what the, the preacher is saying, because I will be coming with some other question tomorrow night. Okay? So God bless you all, and I see you tomorrow. And please, invite the guests out, please. Good evening, church. Um, tonight, health nugget, this evening health nugget is about the sunshine. So, there's a miracle factory at work just under our skin. When the ultraviolet ray hit the skin, the factory goes to work. There are millions of blood cells constantly flowing through very tiny blood vessels throughout every square inch on our skin. There are tiny oil glands under the skin. And these oil glands just beneath the skin are called the sterols. As the sunshine hits the skin, the blood and the sterols are converted into vitamin D. So sunshine doesn't give us vitamin D. Sunshine causes our body to produce vitamin D. And because these um, tiny blood um, oil vessel, oil particles are under the skin, that's why we need healthy fats and not oils. Hi, Toko. We need healthy fats and not oils because they're fats like avocado, um, olives, and sunflowers. Because then oil, the oils are, um, would actually cause your skin to burn when you go in the sun. And this is something I notice in Canada, we're always wearing sunblock. But if the sun is supposed to hit your skin and turn and help you to provide vitamin D, putting sunblock on your skin defeats the purpose, right? So you leave your skin exposed to the sun. The, the sun causes vitamin D to be formed. And then the vitamin D goes throughout your body, which um, increases and gives you strong bones, nails, immune system, helps your heart to work better because it lowers your blood pressure, your blood sugar, your cholesterol level. Sun also kills bacteria, and the oil from your skin, when the sun heats your skin, it uh, releases some vapor, which works as like an antibacteria. So it kills bacteria on your skin. So, I mean, and there goes another problem when you put sunblock on your skin, when you block the sun, you, you keep the bacteria on your skin. Sun also, by killing bacteria, it kills bacteria on your clothing. So if you hang your clothes outside, not only does it kill the bacteria on the clothes, it actually decreases the chemical from your um, detergent on your clothing. So as we can see, sun does a wide variety of stuff. When it goes through your body, when the vitamin D goes through your body, it causes your heart to beat harder and stronger. So it's like, instead of going, um, you know, we, we say, lub dub, lub dub, it goes lub dub, lub dub. And with every beat, it pumps strong. The blood goes stronger, which makes more oxygen goes throughout your body. When oxygen increases, um, your blood pressure goes down, your blood sugar and blood sugar. Sorry, I'm going but jumping back and forth, but I'm just saying it as I remember it. The sun hitting your skin causes your blood sugar, your skin to work as like an insulin-like factor. So your blood sugar goes down. So if your blood sugar goes down, your cholesterol goes down, your um, blood pressure goes down, your respiratory rate goes down, we can see that just from sun, this being in the sunlight, 
we have so many benefits because our, 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 when our respiration goes down, we are relaxed, we can think better. So without going over time, let's this year, I know we haven't been getting a lot of sun. So for the a little bit amount of sun that we have, let's go outside, exercise, and enjoy this one out of the eight things that God has given us for extremely good health. Let's go outside and experience that one thing and get all the benefits that we can from the few hours, minutes that, of the sunshine that we get in the next few weeks. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I just want to say, what better place could we be than here? Right? All of you that came, you chose to be here. We love the message that we've been receiving, and it is such an important and necessary message for us to get ready for the coming of the Lord. Um, so I'm just going to do a little um, introduction into the offering that we're going to be collecting tonight once again. And we're grateful for your offerings, um, whatever you can uh, give to help this uh, cause. So both in the Old and New Testaments, the Lord has set up a system to support his work. And what is the work? The salvation of souls redemption. Everyone that loves the Lord uh, is called to take part by bringing their gifts before the Lord. And right now we have the privilege to participate in that plan, all of us. Uh, in First Chronicles 29, 14, we read, but who am I and what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort because gifts were coming in, so many free uh, offerings. For all things come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee. Do you agree? Everything we have, everything we are, we receive from God. And just a reminder again tonight, in front of you, in, your, in the pews, um, there are envelopes. Um, if you choose to do so, uh, you can put your offering in the envelope. Uh, and under the category other, just mark for evangelistic series. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, may the deaconesses come forward, please. And if you don't mind, I will ask us all to just stand uh, as we pray. Father in heaven, we come before you. Thankful, Lord, that you have brought us here. We thank you for the strength, the life each and every day that you give us anew. And we thank you for this opportunity that we could bring a gift, a small gift, Lord. But your gift, there, there is no measuring the gift that you gave. You gave your life, Lord, for us that we could have eternal life through your great sacrifice. And we thank you and we praise you for that. Please bless the gifts that they may be used to the best benefit, Lord. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
theme. So one thing that you will notice、um, this week is that we have a theme song, and it is called "Revive Us Again." So if you don't know the song, that's okay because we're going to learn together.、Um, the words are on the screen, so I invite everyone to、uh, sing with us. If you're not, you know, a little shy, you can maybe hum a little, and if you're even shy, you can also sing on your mind. We don't. We welcome everyone. So let's sing our theme song, "Revive Us." Again, so we're gonna sing the first and the second verse, and then the、um, and then chorus. So. We'll do it again tomorrow. <laughs> we're so we're so thankful for your presence, Lord. Thank you that you love us with a love that will not cease. Bless us now, and as we come to open Your Word, and Lord, we sense Your presence with us, and for this we're thankful. Revive us, Lord, in Jesus' name, Amen. Good evening. It is such a blessing to see you again tonight as we continue on in our series. We're coming to night number two, and by the grace of God, I said I'm going to ask you something every night that I believe that is going to get. More and more difficult each night that comes because I believe that the the devil's afraid of what we're studying. Was it hard for you to get here tonight? I heard no, no, no. Yesterday I heard no, no's. Today I heard yes. It was a little bit harder. And I'm telling you, I promise you, every night is going to get just a little bit harder. Every night the devil is going to send every demon he can, everything he can do. In fact, I remember as we were doing meetings like this in another place, I was reminding those that were coming. I said, "Listen, the devil will do anything. In fact, if he needed to, the devil would send a snowstorm." Now in Canada, that's not so. That's common for you now. But we were in a place the snow was not falling, and do you know that snow fell that week? That the devil would do anything in order to stop you and I from coming, and this is why we must make it up in our minds: nothing will stop us. If we can put the screen on, we'll come there in a moment. Nothing will stop us from getting ready for the coming of the Lord. I don't want anything to stop me. What do you say? And so, my brothers and sisters, this is why each night I'm telling you: bring not only yourself, but bring a pen and a paper. Now, why do we want to bring pen and paper? Now, if what I'm telling you is true, you should want to be able to take notes to be able to check it out and make sure everything that's being said is factual, it's history, it's evidence, it's Bible. I wouldn't listen to what I'm telling you and not check it out. I would make sure this is not something that is careless. These meetings are not accidental. You didn't just come here accidentally. God and His love is bringing us because He wants to save us, and God is trying to do something now to awaken us. Before it is too late, and this is why we cannot take it lightly. We must say, Lord, if you have brought me here, it is because you want to save me. I'm, a, I'm, I'm be honest with you. God didn't bring me here because I'm some great teacher or minister. He brought me here to save me. 
And I'll be honest with you, he didn't bring you here. If it's d- doing sound or, or, or media or just in the pews or leading out, he didn't bring you here because of that. He brought each of us here because he wants to save us. And because of that, I think that when we come into God's presence, we should recognize that. I don't think that we should let cell phones interrupt God's presence. What do you say? If you have a cell phone, you can right now turn it off or put it on silent. We believe that God is so real, that his presence is so real, that we want to honor and reverence and respect the person of God. Amen? If you'll take your Bibles and turn to Matthew 2 before we get deep into our study this evening. We're going to the book of Matthew, the second chapter. You remember that the name of our series, in just two words, what's the name of our series? Wake up. Now, my brothers and sisters, one of the reasons why we've named it that is because, do you know that if we don't wake up, nothing else that we do will matter? Do you know that the first thing in getting a relationship with Jesus, the first thing is waking up? I mean, think about it right now. If we're going to become like Jesus, we have to do what he did. And do you know what the very first thing Jesus did every day, it was not pray. It was not study. It was not witnessing. Do you know what the first thing that Jesus did every day, if we're going to become like him, we have to know. What was the first thing that Jesus did every day? He woke up. The Bible said he woke up a great while before day and then he went out and prayed. Now, do you know that if you and I spiritually do not wake up, nothing else will matter. If we're praying and studying before we wake up, all that is is a dream. Am I right or wrong? Have you ever dreamed before? I've dreamed before. In fact, you know, you, things that you like to do, sometimes you, you, you can go somewhere that you love. Sometimes you can be eating something. It isn't amazing that when you dream and you eat something, it almost seems like when you're just getting ready to eat the thing you like, you wake up. And you say, man, if I, if I could have just slept a little longer to taste what it was like. But my brothers and sisters, it's just a dream. No matter how good it tasted or smelled or felt, it was just a dream. And when you woke up, you were just as hungry as when you went to bed. And so my brothers and sisters, spiritually, can you imagine a Christian, a seven at Venice, a person in the world, they just, they're saying they're getting closer to God, but they never woke up. All they're doing is dreaming about that. And do you know, to get to know Jesus is going to be, it's going to take more than a dream. Somebody has to wake up. And so, my brothers and sisters, what we're doing this week, we're learning how to wake up. And we're finding out that one of the things that helps us to wake up is understanding the time. The Bible says, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. And we find that when we wake up, the greatest thing that we can do is get to know God. What is greater than getting to know Jesus? Nothing. And so, my brothers and sisters, we've been studying this. In fact, you remember that we learned our first principle together yesterday that told us the first step in getting to know God because in the last days, the greatest thing, the only thing that can take us through the crisis that we're going to study about is to know Jesus. Now, my brothers and sisters, not just in a casual way, but we must know him in something that we have entitled a CIP, a what? You remember what that, now, before we put these markers up here, we want to test them, amen? (laughs) I'm going to try another one. I praise the Lord. Can can you see that? You can't see that. We'll hope that 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 works for us. We'll we'll hope that works for us tonight. C-I-P. What did that C-I-P stand for? Close. Close. The I stood for what? Intimate. The P stood for what? Personal relationship with God. The greatest thing that we can do is get to know God in this way. Now, we laid down a simple principle yesterday that would help us. One of the first principles in getting to know God, we said something in three words. I want to see if you, if you remember. Every night, I give you a couple minutes review. What's the three words, the first principle in getting to know God? After we wake up, what's the first principle? Three words, three words. It takes time. Now, you never want to forget this. This is why even coming out night after night is part of getting to know God. Do you know that you can be anywhere in the world tonight, but you know what you chose to do? You chose to sacrifice and to give God your time. And when you make that commitment every day, God says, if you give me your time, I'm going to give you my time. Now, do you know that time is the stuff that life is made out of? 
When we give God our time, what we're really doing is giving him our life. And so my brothers and sisters, every night we can give God our life by giving him time because in developing a relationship with anyone, guess what happens? It takes time. Do you know that if we treated our wives or husbands the way we re- treated God, we wouldn't have a wife and we wouldn't have a husband. Do you know the average person, he wakes up in the morning, he may spend a few moments just praying to God, and then he goes to work or to school or to play hours at a time. He stops maybe for lunch and maybe for another minute he says the prayer. Thank you for the bird so sweet. Thank you for the food we eat. Maybe another minute praying for the food. Goes back to work, goes back to school, goes back to play. Until five o'clock, three o'clock, he gets home from school, home from work, waiting in the, uh, on the 400 or the 401 or some other uh, interstate, and he's stuck for hours, gets home, looks at the news, looks at one of the other movies or media, social media on his phone, and then he falls asleep. Maybe he says a prayer. Maybe he reads a page from a morning watch, but if you add up the time, not even two hours does he spend with Jesus. And this happens seven days a week, four weeks out of a month, 12 months out of a year, year after year, and still we wonder, why don't we know Jesus? It takes time. And it's amazing, we give the devil all the time. We give the world hours upon hours, but when it comes to Jesus, we have nothing to give him. And so we know the world, we know the devil, but we don't know Jesus. But you know, all that can change tonight. All of that can change tonight by saying, Lord, tonight I'm going to start by giving you time. Now, we're going to, whoever that young man's son of a child is, we're going to have to stop him and let him sit down. We don't believe that we have parents that would just let children run around. This is too serious for that. Jesus is getting ready to come. And if you love your family, you know what you'll do? You'll gather your family up. If you saw your child getting ready to be hit by a car, it would be, it would be indolence to let that child go and let the car hit him. Somebody should grab him and put him down. Am I right? If you love each other, if we love our families, we'll be doing all in our power to try to save them and bring them to Jesus. Now, my brothers and sisters, we found out, that, uh, we found out yesterday something very important. We found out a three-step plan in getting to know God. You remember the three-step plan? Here's an open book test, but I didn't give you the answers. Amen? <laughs> I'm going to test you. What is the first step in this three-step plan in giving God our time? What are we going to start? What are we going to start doing with that time? What's the first thing? Know and understand the time. Does God say we can understand the time? Where in the Bible does God say we can understand the time? Now, come on. Don't, don't, don't look at me with a blank face. You studied this. First Chronicles. Please, if you didn't have it, write it down. Please, tomorrow night you should know it by heart. First Chronicles chapter, chapter 12, verse 32 says that we can know and understand the time. What was number two? What was number two? Know what to, do. to know what to do. And what was number three? That if we would do what God says by his grace, we can become his friend. Now, the first two is in First Chronicles 12, 32. The last or the third point is in John chapter 15 and verse what? 14. If we put those three things together, then we can begin to start studying. And this is why we spend so much time doing what? Studying time. It takes time to get to know God. And God is telling us that if time is running out, we have to understand the time to know what to do. And if we, by God's grace, do what God says, we can become his friend. And it is only the one who becomes God's friend that is going to go through the crisis that is just ahead of us. Now, do we, so what sets everything in motion? To become the friend of God, what sets everything in motion? To know and understand time. And that's why when Jesus came to this earth, when he began to preach the gospel, what was the first thing that Jesus said? The time is fulfilled. He was following his own science. He was following his own equation. He was following his own teaching. And Jesus began to start waking up the Jewish nation, waking up the world to an understanding of the time in which they were living so they would understand there is something to do right now. 
so that we can become the friend of Jesus Christ. This is the greatest thing you and I can do, brothers and sisters. In fact, you remember that we said that if we're going to understand the time, that sets everything else in motion to understand the time. Do you want to understand the time, yes or no? Praise God. Now, my brothers and sisters, you will remember that I said that in understanding the time, we've got to understand jigsaw puzzles. We have to understand what? Now, how many have ever put together a jigsaw puzzle? We had a few people that say they did yesterday. Now, here is considered at that time, there's newer, a newer one today, but here was considered the world's largest jigsaw puzzle. Now, can you imagine? The world's largest jigsaw puzzle at the bottom said it had 24,000 pieces. Can you imagine? You put together a 100-piece jigsaw puzzle or a 1,000-piece, but a 24,000-piece, it could fit across the entire wall. Here, this family put it together. They reached the Hall of Fame. For, being, for putting together the largest jigsaw puzzle in the world with over 20, here was over 18,000 pieces. You can see it went from wall to wall. Can you imagine if you did that, how long do you think it took to put a, to, to get together a puzzle like that? A lot of time. It took what? Time. And so my brothers and sisters, with the time that we have, we've got to put together this jigsaw puzzle. Now my brothers and sisters, we found out that in order to put together a jigsaw puzzle, I said that there are three things that we have to understand. How many things? Three. What was the first? The picture. The second? The, uh, the edge or the border. That's the right, the border, the edge. Give me another name for the border or the edge. Limit. The limits of that puzzle. The ones are furthest in on either side, up and down. And when you put that together, you can begin to see it. You can begin to already start seeing that they've already started on the side, putting together the corners. You see that? They start putting together the edges, the limits, the borders. Then the third part, once we put together the border, then we start putting together the inside, what's inside of it. And when we start doing that, we can put the entire puzzle together. Am I right? Now, my brothers and sisters, we found out that this world is getting ready to come to an end. And in order to understand that, we've got to put together this puzzle that God has put together in the Bible, and we can understand it just like we do this puzzle. So the first step in putting together this Bible, now, this puzzle that we have is not an 18,000-piece puzzle. It's not a 22,000-piece puzzle. But guess how many pieces of the puzzle are in this? You will find that every word in this Bible is a part of the puzzle. The Bible says, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And in this Bible, there are 783,137 words. 783,137 words in this Bible. And all the coming events are fitting in every word of God. To, to understand it, we must study the Bible, the word of God. And my brothers and sisters, that means that every word here is a part of this puzzle. Now, can you imagine if it took them weeks to put together a 20,000-piece puzzle? I wonder how long it would take to put together a 783,137-word puzzle. How long do you think that would take? Someone says a lifetime. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is what we're doing. But now, in order to do this, once we dump these pieces out on the, on the floor, on the table, as we study it, What's the first thing that we have to look at? Talk to me, somebody. What's the first thing? Picture. We've got to look at the picture. Now, my brothers and sisters, yesterday I showed you what the picture was, but I'm not sure if you got it. I want to make sure you get it. See, these people, they're putting together this puzzle. They would fail because imagine now, can you imagine if you saw a, 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 a scene of a lake overlooking a tree? Now, what would be in the water of that lake overlooking the tree? What would be in the water? A reflection. Am I right? And you could actually see that. Now, can you imagine if you didn't know that was the picture, you might actually begin to start putting the tree in the sky and not recognize that the picture shows the reflection in the water and you didn't know that. So you're putting it up there, but it's really supposed to be at the bottom because you say, well, a tree goes there. A tree doesn't go in the water, but the reflection is there. So you've got to see the picture in order to make everything make sense. You understand what I'm telling you? Now, my brothers and sisters... So in order to put together coming events, we've got to understand what the picture is, and then we'll know how it all fits together. Now, I want to ask you a question. Last night, what was the picture? I heard somebody say it right there, my sister. Praise the Lord. Now, we could all say it together. What is the picture? The plan of redemption. That's just very important. You write that down because, see, without understanding that, we cannot put the Bible together. 
Every text in the Bible is unfolding this plan of redemption. So the plan of redemption is the picture that the Bible is putting together from Genesis to Revelation. That's the picture. Now, my brothers and sisters, we found out that that plan of redemption is actually also put together in a picture. That God has made a picture of the plan of redemption. It's almost like a child. If a child was learning something that was a word picture, then what would a good teacher do to help that child learn? He would give them what? What what would a good teacher do if, if, if he's trying to teach a word picture? And the teacher's trying to teach a lesson. What would the teacher do to help let the lesson be learned? He will give them a visual aid. And that visual aid helps to learn what the words are saying. Are you understanding what I'm telling you? A good teacher does that. So in the Bible, God gave a word picture from Genesis to Revelation, but inside of it, he also gave a visual aid. Now, what was the visual aid of the plan of redemption? The sanctuary. And you remember that we got a crash course yesterday and we found out that the sanctuary has how many parts connected to it? How many parts? Three. And what are the name of the three parts? Outer court. What else? Holy place. What else? Most holy place. And we found that from the Bible. Am I right? Now I want you to look at this now. Look at the screen. You watch it? Look at the picture as they're putting together. I want you to look very carefully. Look at the picture. Are you watching? That's the picture. Now, in order to put together the Bible, we've got to understand that picture. In order to understand coming events, we've got to understand that picture. And when we look at that picture, then we can put the Bible together. And anyone who doesn't understand that picture can't really understand the Bible. He can't really understand last day events. He can't really understand why what has happened. Do you know that last night, while you and I went to sleep, a bomb was dropped on Palestine. Over 300 bombs flew out of the sky. And, you, and American fighter planes shot them down along with others. My brothers and sisters, do you know that what is happening over in Israel, it means something for us right here in America. Not because of the way the world believes so, but do you know that American's foreign policy is based on its connection to Israel? There's a reason for this. And the, and the entire evangelical world have a belief based on what they believe. The Bible is teaching. And unless you understand the picture, you don't understand what that means. We've got to go back to this picture. Everything that is happening right now is based on this picture. And so, my brothers and sisters, once we get that picture, we can put it together. Then we can start putting together some limits. Now, I showed you yesterday that every field of knowledge, we see scientists talking about various things. And we found out historians talking about various things, and we found a number last night, last night, a number that many studies, thank you, a, many, a, a, a number that many studies said explain that if we do nothing and changing our course of living, that the entire world will get ready to collapse. Do you remember what year that these studies pointed to? Anybody remember what the year the studies pointed to? 2030. We saw that it was the start. And what year? What year? 2020. Now, these were studies done before 2020. These were studies done by scientists and climatologists and historians and many other fields of knowledge. And they looked at this and they said, based on how we're living, the world will reach a crisis by 2030. Now, my brothers and sisters, the prophet told us that the thinking men and women of all the world would look at the events taking place and they would recognize just by looking at events that the world was on the verge of a stupendous crisis. And all of them who understand intelligently point to this time frame. Now, my brothers and sisters, we're going to have to do something. Do you remember at the first coming of Christ? Do you remember that all of Jerusalem was troubled by the first coming of Christ? Did the majority of the world know that the first coming of Christ was taking place? Did the majority of the world know that? They did not. Did some people know it? Now, tell me some in the church who was aware that the coming of Christ was taking place at the first time. Do you know any name in the Bible? Was there any specific name in the Bible? Simeon. He was a priest inside that temple. Any other person, any, anyone else who knew? Anna. She was there in that temple. John the Baptist was not yet born. Now, my brothers and sisters, oh, he was born, but he was not yet of age to really understand what was taking place. But there were many that understood intelligently that was there. But now, my brothers and sisters, do you know that there were some that were not in the church who recognized that the coming of Christ was to take place? Am I right? Do you know what the Bible says? Let's go to the Bible. Matthew 2. Look what the Bible says in Matthew, the second chapter. Are you there? Amen. 
In Matthew chapter 2, notice what the Bible says beginning in verse 1. The Bible says in Matthew 2 verse 1, it says, Father, please anoint your words. We have opened it in Jesus' name. Amen. In verse 1, the Bible says, now when Jesus was what? Born in Bethlehem of Judea. In the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east, where? To Jerusalem. Now, my brothers and sisters, I want to ask you a question. Did those wise men know that the coming of Christ was at hand? Yes or no? Were they in the church? So now, my brothers and sisters, if history is to be repeated, that as it was in the past, so shall it be in the future, there's nothing new under the sun, that tells me then that just before the second coming of Christ, there will be others, not only in the church, but in the world, that would know that something is about to take place. And what type of men was it at the first coming? Because history will be repeated. What type of men were they? Talk to me. What does the Bible say? Wise men. So just before the second coming of Christ, what type of men would be aware that a crisis is getting ready to take place? What type of men? Now, what did the prophet call those wise men? Talk to me, somebody. The thinking men and women of this world. Everything that prophet says, the Bible says. And my brothers and sisters, what we need to do, because you know that Jesus did not tell them, base your faith on those wise men. Do you know that God, that Anna didn't base her faith on those wise men? Now, those wise men were right, but that's not what she based her faith on. What did they base their faith on? Look what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 2. In Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 2, it says, saying, where is he that is to be born, king of the Jews? Those wise men understood something was about to happen. Look at verse 3. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was what? There was a time of trouble. And all Jerusalem with him, and it's amazing that not only was the world troubled by this news, but even the church at that time was troubled by that news. Can you imagine the seven Adventist church troubled by the message that God gave us? And then the Bible says in the next verse, in verse 4 it says, And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, now he gathered the religious leaders, and do you know what it looked like? The religious leaders were not aware of what was going to take place. And Herod thought that they were trying to trick him because they were so ignorant. And then Herod said, Tell me, do you have any prophecies? And the Bible says, look what it says. In Matthew chapter 2, it goes on to say in verse 4, And when he gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. Let's read verse 5 together. You're there, amen? Verse 5, it says, And they said unto him, him where? In Bethlehem of Judea. Why? Because the wise men said so? Yes or no? For thus it is written where? By the prophet. Now, I want you to understand. What those wise men said and understood was confirmed by the writings of the prophets. Are you understanding? And so we had two things coming together. We had at the first coming of Christ, intellectual information. Pointing to a time frame, not because they were in the church, but intellectual information by wise men who understood what was going on in world events. But at the same time, we had that God, conf God gave evidence of all this from the prophets and their writings. And so what we need to do this week is look not only at what the wise men say, but then we need to go back to the Bible and look at what the prophets say to see do they reach an agreement. Are you understanding? If the wise men say a number, but the Bible does not say a number, we cannot believe it. Because to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to what? If they speak not according to what? This word, it is because there's no light in it. And if the Bible says something, but the wise men don't see it, we don't see the picture of what happened at the first coming of Christ. And history is to be repeated. But what happens when the wise men say something and the Bible says something and it points to the same place? We know that the event is going to trans transpire. That's how it was at the first coming of Christ. This is how it's going to be at the second coming of Christ. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, that history is being repeated. Now, my brothers and sisters, if ever there was a time that we needed a revival, it is now. And so if we're going to have a revival, guess what we need? We need prayer. Am I right? We're going to start praying every night in this week of revival and prayer for two minutes. How long? Is that a long time? Two minutes is not a long time. But you know what is amazing? That when you don't know somebody, two minutes seems like a long time. 
Now, this young man, you, there's too much move. We're not going to be able to let this man come back and forth and back and forth. Amen? Two minutes is not a long time when we don't. Uh, two minutes seems like a long time when we know somebody. Am I right? How many have ever been in an elevator before? Anybody ever, ever been in an elevator? You know what? The number one thing happens in the elevator. You get in the elevator, and it's like a magnet. Everybody look up. <laughs> And they look at the numbers, one, two, three, as if we don't know, you can go to the second floor and the third floor and the fourth floor. It's going, to keep, it's going to keep going that way. But we look up nervously because we don't know each other. And it's amazing how long 20 seconds can seem when you don't know somebody. What we're going to do is spend two minutes. Is that a long time? And we're going to spend two minutes every night. And we're going to begin praying, Lord, bring me a revival, change my heart, my family, save my family, be with this community, be with this church. We're going to pray God that he prepares us. What do you say? And so would you reverently kneel with me as we get ready to approach the Lord in prayer? Would you reverently kneel with me as we approach God in prayer? We're going to spend just two minutes talking to Jesus. Just two minutes. Oh, Father in heaven, we're so thankful, Lord, that we serve such a wonderful and loving God that would not allow a crisis to take place without first sending us warning that we can wake up before it is too late. This is why these meetings have come to this area so that you can reach and speak to us. And Father, it's amazing that two minutes can seem like a long time when we don't know someone. But Lord, we want it to be that night after night and day after day as we start spending more time with you, that these two minutes would seem like a moment because of love. And so, Father, I beg of you tonight that you would begin to move upon our hearts and massage our minds. I pray that you would stop the movement, Lord. There's too much distraction going on. But, Lord, you want to focus us so that we would have our attention fixed on one man whose name is Jesus. While the world is full of distractions, Lord, help us to come aside and to look at Jesus. I pray that you will remove every distraction. I pray that you would speak to me, Lord, I'm feeble, I'm fickle, I'm frail, but you are powerful and strong. Lord, I pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to be unleashed in this church tonight that we will know that we have been with Jesus. And we will see, Lord, that if ever there was a time to wake up and to get ready, it's now. Bless us now as we open your word, for we ask it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you'll take your Bibles, we want to turn to the last book of the Bible. What book did I say? The last book of the Bible. We know the name of that last book in the Bible. The last book in the Bible is the book of Revelation. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 12, and when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. Now, I want to ask that now that we've started the meetings, maybe we can invite our sisters to come back in. If anyone knows you can invite our sisters to come back in, we can sit down in. Everyone can come in at that time. We don't want any distraction up top, up on the bottom. If there's anybody in the hall, we want to bring everybody in that can. I believe that it's too important for us to be missing what God wants to say. What do you say? 
This is not a production. I'm not so much interested in the cameras. I'm interested in the souls that are here first, right here in this building. I believe that Jesus is getting ready to come. Now listen to me, brothers and sisters. The great controversy between Christ and Satan that has been carried forward now for nearly 6,000 years is about to end. And everything in this world is in agitation. We're living in the time tonight of a gathering storm and everywhere we turn in society, we can see it. The handwriting is on the wall. And you can ask anyone in this world who has any intelligence of expertise. And not because I say so, but because fact says so. You can ask the historian. You can ask the man who understands political science. You can ask the economist. You can ask the meteorologist. You can ask the climatologist. You can ask any man of knowledge who understands the Bible. And it's evident to us that something is getting ready to take place in this world. I mean, can you imagine? 300 missiles sent out upon Israel and this means something why is it happening last night and today why now brothers and sisters I'm telling you something something is getting ready to come to this country something is coming to this continent something will come to this world more serious and severe than anything that we've ever witnessed and not one of us in this room is ready tonight not one of us and this is why God says please we must wake up in fact, I read where a prophet wrote in a book called Early Writings, page, page 119, the prophet said, I saw that the remnant were not prepared for what was coming upon the earth. She says, stupidity like lethargy seemed to hang upon the minds of most of those who believed that we had the last message. And then she said her company angel said, with awful solemnity, one phrase, three times, with increasing intensity, get ready, get ready. Get ready, the prophet said, if ever there was a time to get ready, it's now. And there's a reason Satan is attacking this generation because he knows this is not the first generation. This is the last generation. This is the limit generation. In fact, notice what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In verse 12, let's read that together. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12. What does the Bible say in verse 12? It says, therefore, do what? It says in verse 12, therefore rejoice ye heavens. And ye that dwell in them, woe unto the inhabitants of the what? Earth and of the sea. It says, uh, and of the sea. Why? For the devil is come down unto you having what? Great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a what? Short time. The Bible tells us that God knows and Satan is aware that his time is short on this earth and he's doing everything in his power to try to stop the people of God from getting ready and yet we're still not ready. What is the devil doing right now? He's using every power that he has, every form of mass media. He's using the television. He's using billboards. He's using magazines. He's using Netflix. He's using entertainment. He's using uh, every device trying to get our attention. It's amazing what we will watch instead of looking at Jesus. You know, right down the day, they say one of the most famous things that, that those are watching in Canada is something called, uh, what do they call it? Nightmare Kitchen? Uh, kitchen Nightmare. You, that, that's what they're calling Kitchen Nightmare. They said people are watching this. That right now, snake oil and, and all these other things that are coming on, that men are, are, are caught up in all these various things, but is spending no time turning his eyes toward Jesus. Do you know that it is Satan's plan to get us so hooked into the world, so hooked on television, so hooked on YouTube for hours at a time, and yet we have no time to give to Jesus Christ. And this reason tells us, this is why inspiration says, what shall I say to do what? Arouse the remnant people of God. I was shown that dreadful scenes are before us. Satan and his angels are bringing all their powers to bear upon God's people. He knows that if they sleep how? A little longer, he is sure of them, for their destruction is what? Certain. So Satan's plan is to so keep our time busied up, caught up, that we have no time to spend with Jesus. It says, my brother, my sister, if these precious moments are not improved, you will be left how? Without excuse. You know, somebody would say, but Lord, you didn't warn me. You didn't tell me this crisis was here. Do you know that if, if we ever come to the point where we say, Lord, you didn't warn me, do you know that God would actually be able to point us back to this time in Barry, uh, Canada, where we can look and see that instead of a minister simply preaching to us, that angels were trying to impress our hearts of the need of trying to study and get ready before it's too late. Angels trying to say, please don't put work or school above this meeting, above God. Please study, get ready. Time is running out. We would see that God was doing everything in his power to try to reach us. 
And brothers and sisters, many of us have resisted and pulled back, but God is saying, please turn your eyes upon me. And the reason why we're so busy with everything else is because we have not seen the fact that Jesus is attractive. My brothers and sisters, Jesus is beautiful. Do you know that one of the reasons why we spend time looking at everything else instead of Jesus is because we don't see the beauty of Christ. In fact, go to Psalms. What book did I say? We're going to Psalms 96. I want us to see what the Bible says. You see, brothers and sisters, Jesus is beautiful. And if we would ever spend enough time, take the time to look at Jesus, we would see how beautiful he is. One songwriter said, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The reason why the world has such a strong hold upon us and sin looks so attractive is because we won't take time to look at Jesus. But you know, if we look at Jesus, the world will begin to lose its hold upon us. In fact, the Bible says in Psalms 96, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Look at what it says in Psalm 96, verse 6. The Bible says in Psalm 96, 6, it says, honor and majesty are where? are before him strength and beauty are where in his sanctuary if we go into the sanctuary we will see the beauty of jesus you see the beauty of the plan of redemption shows the beauty of jesus christ the beauty of the plan reveals the beauty of this man and the moment we see the beauty of jesus the moment we understand truly the plan of redemption there is born in our soul the spirit of urgency no longer can we be comfortable and complacent. No longer can we be lazy and lackadaisical. We see a need of getting ready and getting ready not slowly, but getting ready fast. You see, there's a spirit of urgency that should be embraced by every one of us. And do you know that in all the Bible, no man was more urgent than Jesus Christ. And you know why? Because no one understood the plan of redemption more than Jesus. That plan creates urgency. Was Jesus urgent? Yes or no? Look at the book of John. What book did I say? We're going to John chapter 9. I want you to notice that Jesus is urgent. And the reason why I take the time to point this out is because you'll find that when someone comes preaching a message like we're preaching tonight, when someone comes teaching like this, teaching the way Jesus did, the first thing that the devil does is that he wants to call us names to make us afraid. He knows that in Canada, we don't like being called names, that we're afraid of that. But you know, brothers and sisters, the Bible says that before long, that we're going to come to a time when we're going to be hated, not just of one person. The Bible says that all nations will hate us for the name of Jesus. If we are not able to withstand hatred now, how do you think we're going to stand in just a little while? My brothers and sisters, and one of the things that we hate is sometimes being labeled by certain names. We're afraid of it, and the devil is tricky. Listen to me. The devil is one of the most tricksters you can ever find. And I'm going to tell you something. Any time in Canada you can make a man think that what he needs in the wintertime is an air condition, you know he's been tricked. That's one thing you don't need in the wintertime in Canada. You don't need an air condition. Then there are places that do. And when you can make a man think in Canada that what he needs in the summertime is a heater, you know he's been tricked. And the devil is just that tricky. And what he does to try to scare us away from truth, he will call us names. He did it to Jesus. He called him a wine bibber, trying to make him stop reaching the people, stop ministering to the harlot and the drug addict. But Jesus went to every member of society. Why? Because love reaches whoever's in need. Jesus wasn't afraid of called, being called names. Are you afraid of being called names? Right? You're quiet and they said, maybe I'm a little bit afraid. <laughs> I'm going to tell you one of the greatest names Satan wants to call you. Fanatic, extremist, legalist, time setter. He calls all these names that are trying to frighten us from a biblical position. And it's amazing that in the world, when you're called these names, the world looks up to it. Now, right now, if a man goes to a basketball game, he looks at the, the, uh, the uh, 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 March Madness. And then he goes from March Madness into the finals and into the championship games in the summertime. When man does that, you know what you call that man who's into basketball, into football? You call him a fan. You know what a fan is? A fanatic. But the fan of basketball, he's praised. He wears the, 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 the shats. His clothes changes because he's a fan. His diet changes because he's a fan. His dress changes because he's a fan. His music changes because he's a fan. His life changes because he's a fan. Everything he has, he has the, 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 the when, when, remember when Toronto Raptors came out? Everybody had the, the jerseys on. Vince Carter, we have to know him. But now my brothers and sisters, it's amazing. 
that when we are now called fans of Jesus, we're afraid, oh, I can't be called a fanatic for Jesus. Well, how can you be called a fanatic for Vince Carter, but not for Jesus? Vince Carter didn't die for you. But Jesus died for us. Jesus is giving his life for us. The moment we see the beauty of Christ, we see the need of urgency. Was Jesus urgent, yes or no? Yes, he was urgent. Do you remember when, at, the, at the baptism of Christ? When John the Baptist was overtaken by the glory of Christ, he said, I can't even tie your shoe. Jesus said, well, we don't have time for all that. He said, baptize me, suffer to be so, not tomorrow. He said, suffer to be so when? Now. Urgent, Jesus was. You remember when he started his preaching? He didn't say we have a hundred years and then we can start preaching to the Jewish nation. He said the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is not far. It is at hand. It's near at hand. Jesus was urgent. You remember when he said to Judas? He said, whatever you do, you must do what? Quickly. Jesus was urgent. And I want you to know tonight, when you embrace the spirit of urgency, you're on safe Bible ground. The Bible says that Jesus was urgent. Notice John chapter 9. Are you there? Amen. In John chapter 9, beginning in verse 4, let's read that together. John 9, verse 4, the Bible says, I must do what? Work the works of him that sent me while it is day. Why, Jesus? Because the night cometh when no man can work. Jesus was urgent. He said, look, I must work now because there's going to come a time when I can no longer work for the salvation of souls. Jesus had a spirit of urgency. You see. Now, my brothers and sisters, it's clear from the Bible that Jesus was urgent. But my question tonight is, was Jesus urgent? I think that's clear. My question tonight is, why was Jesus so urgent? Is that a good question? Now, we want to ask that question. I'm asking you in the room, why was Jesus so urgent? Now, remember, we're in class right now. Don't be afraid to talk to me. In fact, tonight, we, every night, we're going to make it more of a class. And tonight, in fact, I see, I see a big man, I see a big brother right here. Uh, my, my brother, what's your name? Yes. Stephen. Stephen. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to put Brother Stephen at the door in a little bit. And if you don't start answering the question, I'm going to tell Brother Stephen, don't let nobody leave. <laughs> Amen. Now, we're just playing with you. Now, my brothers and sisters, but listen to me. Don't be afraid to answer. We're studying the Bible. In order to study, when a teacher asks a question, guess what the teacher wants? An answer, a response. You see, we can begin to understand the Bible, and we're going to begin to put this puzzle together, and it's going to make sense. Now, my brothers and sisters, why was Jesus so urgent? Does anybody know? I see a hand. Why was he so urgent? Now, look what she said. She said, time is what? Now, what did he know about time that made it so urgent? What do you know about time? I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. You're going to find that Jesus knew that there was a limit. The same condition, or shall I say position, that Jesus was in in his generation, the remnant church, you and I are in, and this last generation, we're in the same position. We're going to see this by the grace of God. He had a limit. We have a limit. Now, my brothers and sisters, Jesus understood. That's what he said. He said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. And then he said, the night cometh. In other words, the time is going to come when no man can work, not even Jesus Christ himself. And I say it reverently. So, my brothers and sisters, what do we call a time when Jesus could no longer work for man's salvation? What do we call that? The close of probation. Jesus knew that there was a limit and probation was going to close and so he was urgent about working because there was only a few moments left. Do you know that in 2024, the limit for this world's history is about to be reached? Probation today is getting ready to close and still we're not ready. And the same thing Jesus did back then, we must do today. Now, does anybody know when the public ministry of Jesus started? What year, what year did the public ministry of Jesus start? Anybody know? He, the public ministry of Jesus started in 27 A.D. How long was the public ministry of Jesus to last? Until what year? Until what year? Until, it was going to last until what? 34 A.D. Now, I want to ask you a question. They tell me in Barry that you're good at mathematics. I'm going to try and test it out. What is 27 and 34? How many years? Seven years. Now, remember last night we found out something, that seven is a biblical number, very special in the Bible. When Jesus started his ministry, he only had seven years left. There were seven years left for the probation of the Jewish nation. 
There were seven years left before his ministry would come to an end and the limit would be reached. And so Jesus was working with urgency, brothers and sisters. He said, I've got to work now. The time is at hand. The night cometh when no man can work seven years. Now, my brothers and sisters, we're going to find out that the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation is built on this number seven. What year did Jesus die? Open book test. What year did Jesus die? 31 AD. Now, I want to ask you a question. Did Jesus know that he was going to die in 31 AD? Yes or no? Yes. Did he know the year he was going to die in 31 AD? Yes. Did he know the month he was going to die in 31 AD? Yes. Did he know the day he was going to die in 31 AD? Yes. Did he know the minute he was going to die in 31 AD? Yes. 3 p.m. The 14th day of the first month AB. Jesus understood it. Now, my question tonight is how did Jesus know that his limit on dying on the cross was going to be reached? How did Jesus know when he was going to die on the cross? Was it because he's God and he's infinite in knowledge? Is that the way he knew in his humanity? That's not how. We're going to find that in his humanity, he studied the scriptures just like you and I should study. He found out all of this because he had the greatest book in the universe at his disposal. What is the greatest book in the universe? Talk to me, somebody. The Bible. That's why when Jesus taught, what was his words over and over again? It is written. It is written. Everything he taught, everything he believed, everything he practiced, he understood it from the word of God. And you and I today got to get back to that word. That's why I said every night, bring your Bible. Amen. Did you bring your Bible tonight? Let me see your Bible. I love to see those Bibles. Let me see your Bible. Praise God, a church of Bibles. You can't have revival without Bible. You see, everything we say, we got to test and make sure that it's from the Word of God. Today, we're living in a time of, of religion where men put more trust into ministers and to pastors and to churches than we do in the Bible. I don't know about you, but I don't put my church above my Bible. I don't care what my church says. If it conflicts with the word of God, I've got to follow what God says. And today, God is looking for his people. The way God knows who are he is, is not by church denomination or religious affiliation. He says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And so today, God knows who are he is because they listen and follow and live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And you will find that this is how Jesus lived. This is what it means to be a Christian, to be like Christ. And when we're just like Jesus, we'll live by every word that proceeds out of his mouth. Now, in the Bible, what did Jesus study to let him know that there was a limit? What did Jesus study to know there was a limit? He studied the Bible, but what in the Bible was he studying that let him understand what that limit was? The plan of redemption. Now, how did he study the plan of redemption that made him know when he was going to die? He studied something that gave him an understanding of that plan of redemption. What did he study to give him a better understanding of the plan of redemption than anyone else had on the earth? What did he study? Talk to me, somebody. He said, the prophecies, I'm giving you a hint right there. What did he study? What did he study? He studied the sanctuary. You remember that in the sanctuary, there was something brought every day to that sanctuary. What was brought to the priest every day? A lamb was brought. And that lamb, what did that lamb do? What had, to, what had to happen to that lamb? Every day, that lamb had to what? Die. And that death of the lamb was typical, or was a, it was an example of the death of Jesus. Am I right? Jesus began to study this at the age of 12. Don't you remember in Luke chapter 2? He went to the temple, and for the first time, he saw physically this visual aid. He had been studying the scriptures. He understood this, and at 12, he began to recognize that lamb is me. He found himself in the Bible. He found himself in prophecy. He found his generation, and he recognized, I don't have long left. Jesus understood at the age of 12, he only had a few years before he would go to that cross. And everything in his life now was bent and built on him preparing for that time. Now, my brothers and sisters, what was he studying in the sanctuary that let him know when he was going to die? What was he studying inside that sanctuary? What he was studying inside that sanctuary is something called the great clock of time. The what? Great clock of time. You say, what do I mean? Go in your Bible to John chapter 7. You're in John 9. Drop back two chapters. In John chapter 7, notice what the Bible says in John chapter 7. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. 
In John chapter 7, notice what the Bible says in John 7 beginning in verse 6. Jesus understood the great clock of time. Notice what it says in John chapter 7 beginning in verse 6. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Let's read that together. Verse 6 says, Then Jesus said unto them, My, what's the next word? My time is what? Not yet come, but your time is always ready. Jesus understood his time. Jesus knew it's not my time yet to die. Do you know that all through the Bible, you'll see Jesus talking about his time, his time, his time. He knew the time. Look at verse 8, same chapter. John 7 and verse 8. Verse 8 says, go ye up into this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast. Why? For my time is not yet full come. Jesus understood his life was on a timetable. He knew that everything in his life was to happen on time. And Jesus said, look, they can't touch me now. They can't kill me now because it's not yet time for me to die. And everything is going to happen according to what is written by the prophets. He said, I tell you before it come to pass, so that when it come to pass, you might believe. Now, my brothers and sisters, look at John chapter 8 over and over again. We don't have time tonight to look at all the texts, but we look at a few texts. Look at John chapter 8. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In John chapter 8, you'll notice again and again, Jesus pointing out what his time was, his hour was. He knew this great clock of time. In John chapter 8, beginning in verse 20, let's read that together. John 8 and verse 20. Now, would you you share your Bible, my sister in the front? Would you share your Bible so we can begin to look at this together? We want to make sure everybody can see Bibles. In John chapter 8, notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse 20. In John 8 verse 20, let's read that together. It says, these words spake who? Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple and no man laid what hands on them Jesus was speaking words that the religious leaders wanted to stop him and crucify him and I'm telling you something today even what you're hearing tonight many will try to stop what you're hearing tonight but you cannot stop what Jesus wants to accomplish the Bible says that they tried to stop and lay hands on him but it says for the, but they could no man could lay hands on him why for his hour was not yet come Jesus had a time to live and a time to die now my brothers and sisters Jesus understood the great clock of time now someone says well I see what you're talking about the time and he knew the time and he knew the time but how do you get the idea of the great clock I see the time but how do you get the great clock now there's a clock in the back of this room Now, one of the first things you see on one of those old-fashioned clocks like the one that is set there now is that you have a number, and how many numbers are on that clock? How many numbers? Twelve. That's what we call that clock. Now, go to John chapter 11, and notice what the Bible says. In John chapter 11, we'll see Jesus understood the great clock of time. In John chapter 11, notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse 7. In John chapter 11, beginning in verse 7, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In verse 7, let's read that together. The Bible says, then after that, Jesus, uh, excuse me, after that, he said unto his disciples, let us go again into, let us go into Judea again. What did his disciples say? The disciples said, no, don't do that. You remember? They said, look, they tried to stone you. They tried to kill you. Why would you go back to where they tried to kill you? Look what the Bible says. Going on, the Bible says in verse 8. His disciples saying to him, Master, the Jews of late have sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Verse 9, Jesus wasn't afraid. Jesus was no coward. Jesus understood something. Verse 9 said, Jesus answered, are there not what? Talk to me, somebody. Are there not what? Twelve hours in a day? He highlighted this clock. He said, are there not twelve hours in a day? It goes on, if any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not. Why? Because he seeth that the light of this world. In other words, Jesus said, look, my hour has not yet come. There are twelve hours in the day, and until my day of living runs out, according to the prophets, no one can touch me. You know that Jesus understood that he was going to die on time. Jesus understood this great clock of time. And so, my brothers and sisters, if Jesus understood this great clock of time, should you and I understand it today, yes or no? And so, my question is, how did Jesus know that great clock of time? You say he had the Bible. That's right. What did he study in that Bible to let him know this great clock of time? He studied the plan of redemption. Well, how did he understand the plan of redemption? He studied the sanctuary because the sanctuary is the place of understanding. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I therein. So Jesus went into the sanctuary and guess what he studied inside this sanctuary that let him know the time he was going to die. 
You'll notice that I put a number one right there. Now, before I tell you this or ask you this or study this with you, I want to ask, I know you thought I forgot because I didn't mention it. Did you do your homework? Now, don't look, no, don't look down now. You know, you've been in class. The teacher come out. Did, you, did anybody do their homework? Everybody. Did you do, you know, you, they always knew who to call to. You always called the one who looked down. Now, if there are any teachers in here, I'm going to have to ask you, why did you do that? <laughs> but you, you called the one who looked down. You knew they did not know. And if you're a good teacher, you want them to learn and understand. Am I right? I hope so. Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is what we want. God wants us to understand. Now, let me see the hand. Now, does anybody remember? Does everybody remember what the homework was? We gave you two pieces of homework. What was the homework? To read what? Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. Did you read it? Yes or no? Praise the Lord. I'm going to test you in a little while. I'm going to test you. Then we said, I want you to read a, 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 a chapter, not a whole chapter, but just a few pages in the chapter of great kind of, uh, excuse me, I shouldn't have told you. In what book did I say we, I want you to read? Great, great controversy. In the chapter, anybody, anybody remember the name of the chapter? Prophecies fulfilled. Anybody remember the pages? 398 to 41. How many? Let me see the hands of those who did the homework. Let me see the hands. All right, I see a few hands. And judging by the percentage, that's about the percentage of how many people are going to go to heaven too. Now, you know it's amazing? That when we get homework, do you know that sometimes the way we respond to homework actually shows what's going to happen with the homework God has given us? So my brothers and sisters, guess what? But a good teacher, guess what God's going to do? He's going to give us another chance to do their homework some more. What do you say? But you know, there is a limit. There is a limit. Now, in Leviticus 23, guess what you find? In Leviticus 23, if you read the entire chapter, the whole chapter is given to talk about the seven feasts of the sanctuary service. The seven feasts of the sanctuary service, and they had seven of them. And the first of the seven feasts, now, I want you to know all the names of those seven feasts because those seven have to do with the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation because the Bible is built on the number seven. Now, my brothers and sisters, what was the first of those seven feasts? Anybody remember the name of the, of the of first of the seven feasts? What was it called? It was called the Passover. Do you know that the Passover just went by? Am I right? I was going through the airport on my way to Canada, and we saw Jews that were in their uh, Orthodox clothing. You saw the men with the hats and, and, the, and, 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 the, and, the, and the strings on the side. I forget the name right now. Uh, on the side, you saw where the women were dressed in a certain way. They were coming together, getting ready to celebrate the Passover. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know that if we understood the sanctuary, we would have a better opportunity of presenting Jesus to the Jew? You see, the reason why the Jewish nation rejected Jesus at, at the first coming was because they did not understand the beauty of the plan of redemption. If they saw the beauty of their service, they would have accepted Christ. Many Christians are still rejecting Jesus because we don't understand that plan. That plan takes us from the beginning of time to the end of time, from Genesis to the book of Revelation. And all we have to do is not make up anything, but just study the Bible, not what a man says, not what a church says, but what does God say in his word? Is that the Christian position? Jesus said, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Let's notice now what Jesus did. Jesus studied the plan of redemption through those services. In fact, you will find, did Jesus have the book of Leviticus, yes or no? Do you know that in the Bible that Jesus quoted from the book of Leviticus? Remember when Jesus said, when they asked Jesus, what is the two great commandments in the law? What did Jesus say? Thou shalt love thy what? Lord thy God with all the mind, the heart, the soul, his strength. You know that came from the book of Deuteronomy? Then he said, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That came from the book of Leviticus. Leviticus. Jesus studied the book of Leviticus. Now, my brothers and sisters, the first feast in Leviticus 23 is the Passover. Does anybody know uh, 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 the day of the Passover? Anybody know the day of the Passover? Now, have you ever wondered why in Seventh-day Adventist history, we talk about October 22nd, 1844. You ever heard that before? October 22nd, 1844. Now, have you ever wondered how did those Seventh-day Adventists come up with that number, October 22nd, 1844? We're going to see tonight that it came from the same place that caused Jesus to know how he died. That the church is intimately connected, the Seventh-day Adventist church intimately connected with the death of Jesus. We're going to show you this from the Bible. Now, my brothers and sisters, Great Controversy 399, you remember that number? This is part of your homework. I'm reading some of the sentences from your homework. Let's read this together. It says, arguments drawn from the what? 
Old Testament types also pointed to the autumn as the time when the, e- when the event represented by the cleansing of the sanctuary must take place. Now, the cleansing of the sanctuary is one of those seven feasts. It's feast number six. It's called the Day of Atonement. Now, my brother and sister goes on to say, this was made very clear as attention was given to the, what's that next word? Manner in which the types relating to the first advent of Christ had been fulfilled. So in the Old Testament types, they were pointing out the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, my brothers and sisters, it says types. Now, does anybody know what a type is? It's not talking about a typewriter. That's not what it's talking about. Does anybody know what a type is? Now, in the Bible, let's go to Hebrews. What book did I say? Go to Hebrews chapter 8. I want to give you an example quickly. Go to Hebrews chapter 8. Now, you will find that in the, in the sanctuary, we have many types. A type, another word that comes from the Greek word tupos, it means a pattern. Has, has anybody ever sowed before? Anybody ever did some sowing before? Now, when you get ready to sow, what do you use if you're getting ready to sow? Uh, you're going to use it. What do you use to sow to know how, where to make the dress, where to cut it, and how to cut it? What do you use? A pattern. Now, what is that pattern? That pattern shows you how to cut the shape. It shows you exactly what it is. In fact, it is a copy of what you're getting ready to make. Am I right or wrong? Now, my brothers and sisters, a type is an example. It is a pattern. And do you know it is what is called a shadow? Look at what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 8. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty. Where? Where is this high priest? Where? In the heavens. Verse 2. A minister of the, what's the next word? Sanctuary. Where is the sanctuary? Talk to me, somebody. In the heavens. It says, and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not what? Now, remember on earth, God had a copy of the sanctuary in heaven built on earth. He had an example of the sanctuary in heaven built on earth. He had a type of the sanctuary in heaven built on earth. When he said to Moses, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, it was based the earthly sanctuary after the heavenly sanctuary. In fact, the Bible says it. Look what the Bible says. In in Hebrews 8 verse 3 it says, in verse 3, For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore it is a necessity that this man has someone also to offer. Verse 5, let's read verse 5 together. It says, Who serve unto the, what's the next word? Example and what else? So we see that a shadow or shadow is an example. It's a type. It's a pattern. It lets us know what's going on. In fact, it says it's an example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle or the sanctuary, he said, For see, saith he, that thou make how many things? All things according to the pattern shown to thee in the mount. In other words, don't do anything in that sanctuary that was man-made. Everything in that sanctuary was built after a pattern and after a shadow. Every service had a specific purpose. The earthly sanctuary showing the heavenly sanctuary. One, the earth, a shadow of the heavenly. Now, why is that important? Because if I understand the shadow, I can understand the real thing. Everything that is real has a shadow. Do I have a shadow, yes or no? Now, you can look now. Whenever a light hits me, you can see a shadow. You can look on the board, and you can see a shadow. Now, the shadow doesn't do anything but what the literal thing does. So, if I want to know if the literal thing is moving, all I really have to do is look at the what? Even if you couldn't see the real thing. If you looked at the shadow, you could know what the real thing was doing. Does that make sense? So now, my brothers and sisters, Jesus was foreshadowed in the sanctuary from the outer court, in the holy place, and in the most holy place. And it shows us what Jesus was going to do from the beginning of time to the end of time, from Genesis to the book of Revelation. Now, my brothers and sisters, did Jesus come to this earth as a lamb? Yes or no? You remember when John the Baptist saw Jesus? What did he call Jesus? What did he call Jesus? The Lamb of God. Well, what was the Lamb? The Lamb was a shadow. The Lamb was an example. 
The lamb was a type. And Jesus knew he was going to die by looking at the lamb and knowing that the lamb represented himself. And when he saw that, he said, just as that lamb must die, I must die. Do you understand? And it's because of that death that you and I have the opportunity of salvation. Now, my brothers and sisters, but most people's understanding of the plan stops right there. Most Christians' understanding of the plan stops right there, but that's not the end. That's only the beginning. But Jesus is Alpha and Omega, first and last, beginning and end. So it says, this was made very clear as attention was given to the manner in which the... Now give me another name for types. Give me another name for types. Shadow, another name. Example, another name, pattern. You see, the shadow does not have a substance. But the real thing has a substance. Type is shadow. Anti-type is the real thing. It's the substance. It's the actual fulfillment. Now look what this says. Now watch what this says. Going on, great controversy. It says, the slaying of the Passover lamb was a shadow. Give me another name. It was a type. It was a example. Good. It says, it was a shadow. It says, these types... Let me back that up there. It says, the Passover lamb was a shadow of the death of Christ. Said Paul, Christ, our Passover, is what? Sacrifice for us. Is that in the Bible, yes or no? Where in the Bible? 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Write that down. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7 that Christ is the Passover. He's the lamb of that Passover. It goes on to say, these types were fulfilled not only as to the event, but as to the... Now, remember, we're trying trying to understand the time, that great clock of time. It said these types were fulfilled in two ways. They were fulfilled not only as to the what? Not only as to the what? Event, but as to the what? The time. Now, that's very important. Both of these had to be fulfilled not only as to the ev- not only as to the event, but as the time. It says these types were fulfilled not only as to the event, but as to the what? Talk to me, somebody. Time. Now, let me give you an example of what that meant. What was the event of the Passover? The event of the Passover showed that a lamb would have to be taken. And that lamb would be taken in order for someone to live and not have the death angel kill them for them to be passed over and they have life. They needed blood to be put on the doorpost. Am I right or wrong? But that blood came from the slayed lamb, from the dying lamb. So we need blood, but if no death, no blood. No blood, no everlasting life. We're forgiven by the blood of Jesus. And so there had to be blood and salvation and redemption. Without the shedding of blood, no remission of sin. So the event of the Passover, the event of that Passover is the death of Jesus on the cross. But that is the event. But this event had to be fulfilled when? Had to be fulfilled when? On time. Now I want you to understand what I mean by that. Do you know what that meant? That meant that when Jesus died in 31 AD, guess what day it was when Jesus died in 31 AD? Guess what day it was? It was the 14th day of the first month, amen. Do you know that for 1,500 years, a lamb had been being killed every day, uh, 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 every 15, every 14 day for 1,500 years, a lamb had been killed on the 14th day of the first month, amen, year after year after year after year. Look what it says. On the 14th day of the first Jewish month, the very day and month on which for 15 long centuries the Passover lamb had been slain. Christ, having eaten the Passover with his disciples, instituted the feast which was to commemorate his own death as the lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the... Let's read that together. That same night he was taken by wicked hands to be what? Now I want you to make sure you understand this. Do you know that Jesus knew he was going to die on that Friday. The reason why he knew he was going to die on what we call today Good Friday, the reason why he knew that was because that Friday was the 15th day of the first month. He died at between the two evenings at 3 o'clock, just as the Bible says in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. He died on time, so much so that, do you know, brothers and sisters, when you read about this in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, when you read about it in Desire of Ages, do you know that it says that you remember the last three words of Jesus on the cross on the Passover when he died? Remember, the Jews would not go in because they said we would defile ourselves because it is the Passover. That's John, Matthew, Mark, Luke. 
Now, my brothers and sisters, do you remember the last three words of Jesus? What did he say? It is finished. And when Jesus made that word, do you remember what happened? The Bible tells later on that there was an earthquake that took place. Now, you must understand. Do you know those Jew, the Jewish nation, they were very much sticklers for time. They, they strained at a gnat and anise and coming. They were very clear on everything they did. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know that at 259, because they knew that the lamb had to be, to be killed at 3 o'clock, at 259, that priest was already in place. 259, 30 seconds, his hand was up, getting ready to come down like Abraham's hand. You read in Zyrvesia in the chapter called Calvary. You read in the Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. And as he got ready to kill the lamb, exactly at 3 p.m., his hand began to come down. But then an earthquake took place. And when the earthquake took place, that priest stood back. From his nerveless hand, the knife fell to the ground. The veil in the temple was rent from the top to the bottom, showing that God ripped that veil by himself, showing that that earthly century, sanctuary surface had come to an end. Jesus died. Why? Because type had met anti-type. And it happened on time. You know, Jesus died on time. And guess what? He resurrected on time. Jesus went back to heaven on time. He went into the holy place on time. He went into the most holy place October 22nd, 1844 on time. And guess what? Jesus is going to come back on time. This is the great clock of time and the devil does not want us to understand this time because when you and I understand it just as they were ready for the coming of Christ you and I will be ready for a second coming and so the devil says keep them in ignorance about this truth now my brothers and sisters look what this says these types were fulfilled not only as to the event but as to the time now I want to ask you a question does the Bible tell us that this is how Jesus knew he's going to die does the Bible tell us that let me show you go to Matthew what book did I say Let's go to Matthew chapter 26. Let me show you everything I said right here in the Bible. Everything that prophet says, the Bible says. Look at Matthew chapter 26. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. And Matthew 26, notice what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 26. And look what the Bible says beginning in verse, uh, beginning in verse 3. Matthew 26 verse 3. What does the Bible say? It says, then assembled together. Matthew 26 verse 3. It says, then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest who was called what? Caiaphas. Verse 4. And consulted that they might take Jesus by, what's the next word? Now subtlety, what does that mean? They were trying to take him openly or they're trying to take him secretly. So they were having a secret meeting to take Jesus. And it'd be, it'd be amazing, you know, brothers and sisters, that Satan tries to work by secret to stop God's messages. Do you think it's possible that Satan could secretly be trying to work to stop these messages? You think so? The devil's afraid of this. But guess what? You cannot stop what Jesus is doing. Now, the Bible says that subtly they tried to kill him. Verse 5 says, but they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the what? Talk to me, the people. So he said, we're going to try to do it secretly. We don't want everybody to know. But guess what? Did Jesus know about this? Yes or no? Jesus was aware of the secret meetings because surely God will do nothing but reveal his secret to his servants, the prophets. Look at verse 2. Look at what Jesus said while they're having this secret meeting. And then guess what day it was? You know when they're having this secret meeting? It was Wednesday night. They should have been at prayer meeting. I'm going to say that again. They should have been at prayer meeting, but they were having a secret meeting to kill Jesus. Now, my brothers and sisters, look at Matthew 26, verse 2. Verse 2 says, you know that after what, everybody? Two days is the feast of Passover. So Jesus said, look, there's only two days left in my life. How did Jesus know that he only had two days left? How did he know that? Look what the Bible says. You know that the two days is the feast of Passover and the Son of Man is betrayed to be, talk to me somebody, crucified. It shows us that Jesus understood and connected the event of the death of Christ to the Passover lamb. And he understood not only as to the event, but he understood as to the time. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is what let him understand that great clock of time. But this is not the end. The Passover is just the beginning. How many feasts are there? Talk to me. Seven. What's the second feast called? Unleavened bread. What's the third feast called? First fruits. What's the fourth feast called? Pentecost. What's the fifth feast called? Feast of trumpets. What's the sixth feast called? The day of atonement, cleansing of the sanctuary. What's the seventh feast called? The feast of tabernacles. You can find all this in Leviticus 23. Do your homework. 
Leviticus 23. Jesus studied this. Now, my brothers and sisters, the Passover was not the end. It was only the beginning. Now, my brothers and sisters, you'll notice that I have first six down here, and then I have a seventh up there. Why do you think that I separated the sixth from the seventh? I'm going to tell you why. The first six feasts happen on earth. The seventh feast does not happen on earth. The seventh feast happens in heaven. Now, my brothers and sisters, if that's so, I need to be able to prove that from the word of God. And just as Jesus died on the cross, his death is connected to everything from first to seven. And if you reject his death on the cross, then you reject the rest of the feast. If you reject the rest of these seven, then you have to reject his death on the cross. It all falls together or stands together. Now, my brothers and sisters, these were shadows. These were types. These were examples. What we need is not the type. We need to understand the antitype. The lamb that died, that cannot save any one of us. But the real lamb, Jesus Christ, does have a part to play in our salvation and redemption. Does it make sense? The shadows can't save us, but the reality does. So now, my brothers and sisters, this is what God wants to show us. Now, my teacher, before he died, taught me a saying. All sevens take us to heaven. Now, I want you to say that with me. All sevens take us to heaven. One more time. All sevens take us to heaven. You'll find the Bible is built on this number seven. And when you go to the book of Revelation, every seven, when you get to it, you're going to end up being in heaven. The seven churches, that's after the seven church, we go to heaven. The seven seals, after the seven seal, we're in heaven. The seven trumpets, after the seven trumpet, we're in heaven. The seven plagues, after the seven plagues, we're in heaven. Seven, 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 seven is the limit, the last. Now, my brothers and sisters, God wants us to understand this because when we understand this, we'll understand what's happening in this world's history. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is why we must study this together. In like manner, watch what the prophet says, in like manner, the types which relate to the second advent. Now, I want to let you know something. The seven feasts, four of them related to his first coming. Three of them related to, it relates to his second coming. The first four types were in the spring. They represent the first coming of uh, the events surrounding the first coming of Christ. The last three were in the fall after a long summer, a uh, break in between. And the last three represents the events that connect to his second coming. And look what the prophet says. In like manner, the types which relate not to his first advent. That's not what it says. The types which relate to the what? Second advent can be fulfilled anytime we want. It must be fulfilled at the time pointed out in the symbolic service. So my brothers and sisters, we're going to find out. We need to find out what does the symbolic service tell us? Oh, what is that doing there? Anybody know what that is? Big Ben. Where is Big Ben? In Greenwich, England. Now, my brothers and sisters, I want to ask you a question. I've been there before. I've been doing meetings like this. In fact, I did a meeting like this and had this clock up. What is Big Ben known for? Anybody know what Big Ben is known for? Someone is known for being big. <laughs> what is Big Ben known for? Anybody know what Big Ben is known for? It's an iconic uh, 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 place. It's very special to the history of this, uh, to, to, to especially uh, to many nations of the world. Anybody know what it's known for? It's known for being the time setter. Do you know the brothers and sisters that we have something called time zones. How many have ever heard of a time zone? Now, what time zone is, is Canada on? What time zone is Canada on? It's on what? On Eastern Standard Time. You can, go, you can go to another place and isn't it called what? What's another time zone? You have central time zone, another time. Now, do you know that those time zones were not always here? You know, do you know when the time zones got made? The time zones were made a little over 137 years. It was in 1884, something took place that was known as the... Uh, International Meridian Conference. It happened in Washington, D.C. And this is what actually set time zones. And what it did, it, because the world was getting drawn closer together through travel, through communication, through business, it made sense for people to be able to synchronize business. Imagine you're trying to get a stock done here and the stock market is closed over here. The people close it. You got to synchronize everything. You understand what I'm saying? And so they made time zones so they can synchronize business and communication. And so they came together. Uh, over 24 nations of the world came together. 
most of them accept it to make a stationary point where all numbers will be counted or all time will be counted and to set their clocks from that time. And they chose a place in Greenwich, England, that was the zero of longitude in which all time started. There was a few people that rejected. One of the people that rejected was France. And France, if you notice that, where it sits, because they didn't accept it, they're nine minutes and 21 seconds away from the time that has been set from Greenwich, England. And so if you ever meet a French man and he's late nine minutes, give him some grace. Amen. No, but, but this is what he's saying. They didn't, re- they didn't accept it. And so now my brothers and sisters, but, but most nations did. That set the foundation so that from this point forward, in 1884, this clock became known as the great clock of time. But now, my brothers and sisters, this is not really the great clock of time. Look what it says in Desire of Ages 31. Let's read what it says. It says, the Savior's coming was foretold where? In Eden. Genesis 3.15, we studied last night. From the days of Enoch, the promise was repeated through patriot and prophet, keeping alive the hope of his appearing, and yet he came not. The prophecy of Daniel revealed the time of his advent, but not all rightly interpreted the message. Why? They did not go into the sanctuary to understand the plan of redemption. It says, century after century passed away. The voices of the prophets ceased. The hand of the oppressor was heavy upon Israel, and many were ready to exclaim, the days are prolonged and every vision faileth. It says, going on, it says, but like the stars in the vast circuit of their appointed path, God's purposes know no haste and what else? No delay. In other words, God's purposes happen on time. It says, Through the symbols of the great darkness and the smoking furnace, God had revealed to Abraham the bondage of Israel where? Where? In Egypt. Do you know that God told Israel how long they were going to be in Egypt? How long were they going to be there? Over 400 years, God told them. He told them back in Genesis before they ever got into the the Egyptian bondage. It uh, uh, It says, and he had declared the time of their sojourning should be 400 years. Afterward, he said, shall they come out with great what? Substance. That was in Genesis 15. Against that word, all the power of Pharaoh's proud empire battled how? In vain. It says, on the self-same what? Now, I want to make sure you understand this. This is coming from Exodus 12, 41. In Exodus 12, 41, you know that when the children of Israel left Egypt, it said it happened on the self-same day. In other words, it's saying the very day that God said in Genesis 15, they will come out, they came out as to the day God said it. It happened on time. It says, so in heaven, heaven's counsel, the hour for the coming of Christ had been what? Talk to me, somebody. Determined, it says, when the great clock of time pointed to that hour, Jesus was born where? In Bethlehem. And Jesus was born on time. It says in the fullness of time, Jesus was born to us, Galatians 4.4. Not only was he born on time, but Jesus was baptized on time. Jesus died on time. Jesus resurrected on time. Jesus went back to heaven on time. He went into the holy place on time. October 22nd, 1844, he moved into the most holy place on And Jesus Christ is going to come back, guess what? On time. This is the great clock of time. And what you and I have to do is find out where are we in that great clock. Because Passover was number one. That wasn't the end. That was the beginning. But that's about as far as most Christians have gone. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is the great clock of time. Not that. The great clock of time is not on earth. The great clock of time is where? Talk to me, somebody. In heaven. The great clock of time is in that sanctuary. Thy way, O God, is where? In the sanctuary. Go to Psalm 73. What book did I say? Go to Psalm 73 and look, the entire Bible tells us over and over again. Psalm 73, let's turn there. Now, my brothers and sisters, you're going to Psalm 73. Look at what this says. Now, we get rid of it. Now, we, um, um, let, me, let, me have, let me have somebody look for it. Let, let me find uh, uh, one of my friends over there. Now, I want you to look at this, young brother. Look at this right here. You see, you, you see, that, you see that clock right there? You see that clock? Now, that's not the, yeah, yeah, yes. You see that clock? That's not the real clock. Let me show you the real clock. Let me, let's get rid of that clock. Let's get rid of that clock. Are you ready? Watch it. Let's get rid of that clock. Boom, you saw that clock. Get rid of it. <laughs> I love it. Now, let's go back in. Let's get rid of it. Let's get one more time. You watching? Boom. Now, the real clock is in heaven. The plan of redemption sets the great clock of time. And let me tell you something. Hold your seats. Hold your seats. The great clock of time is set for 7 
thousand years. Did you hear what I said? Now, we're going to prove this from the Word of God. We can't do it all tonight, but we're going to show you from the Bible itself that the, the prophets tell us this. The plan of redemption is set for 7,000 years. Remember, what number? You remember that computer has a binary code in which everything in the computer is built off of. What is the number built off of? Zero and one. Well, the Bible has a, has a, a unicode. The world has a unicode, and what is it built off of? Seven. You're going to find there's a reason why seven Adventists are called seven Adventists. God has put us in that code. Now, my brothers and sisters, look what this says. In Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve sinned, guess what happened? The clock started ticking. Why? Now, do you know that before man sinned, the world could have lasted forever? God said that man, if he had been obedient, remember what God said in Genesis 2? He said that you can be obedient, then you can eat from the tree of life and live how long? Forever. Man would have lived without dying according to Genesis 2. But when man sinned, something happened. What is the nature of sin? The Bible says the wages of sin is, now does death perpetuate life or does death put a limit on life? The wages of sin is death and when death is finished, it's over. It's over. That's the limit. And so death came by sin. So the nature of sin is that when sin entered the world, it set a limit on how long the world could last. And that limit, we're going to prove, is 7,000 years. And we're going to find out 6,000 years on earth and 1,000 years, guess where? In heaven. And the clock started ticking. And Leviticus 23, the shadows take us from all through these 7,000 years from the beginning to the end. And we can find the first generation and we can trace it where? All the way to the final generation, to the last generation. Look what this says as we get ready to bring out to some final points. It says, can this work of redemption go on forever or does it have a limit? Yes or no? Can it go on forever? Is there a limit? Did we find that from the Bible last night? I heard somebody say in Jeremiah chapter 5, that's right, Acts 17 showed us that the world has a limit and the sanctuary actually reveals where that limit is. Now, where's the place to understand the limit of how long the world's going to end? Where's the place to understand that? Where's the place? The sanctuary. Where's the place to understand that 7,000 year sets the limit? Where's the place to go to understand this? Look at Psalm 73. What book did I say? In Psalm 73, let's read that together, beginning in verse 16. Verse 16 says, when I thought to know this, it was what? It was what? Too painful for me. Verse 17, until I went where? Into the sanctuary of God, then what? Understood I there. So where do I need to go to understand the end? Where do I need to go? Talk to me somewhere. Where do I need to go? Inside that sanctuary. And so, my brother and sister, when you go inside the sanctuary, something happens. This sanctuary is repeated every year, and it shows us the whole plan of redemption from first to seven. Now, read this together with me. Actually, the Apostles, page 14, it says, Through the teachings of the sacrificial service, Christ was to be uplifted before how many nations? All nations. And all who would look to him should live. Christ was the foundation of the what? Jewish economy. Talk about the whole types and systems. It says, The whole system of. Give me another name for types. Another name for types. Shadows, example, the whole system of types and, and symbols was a, was a what? Compacted prophecy. Now, I want to ask you a question. What does compact mean? That you make it or small. Now, now imagine, I, when I came here, we, we had to pick up a rental car when we flew into Canada. And when we picked up a rental car, you have different things that you can rent. You, you have different names. You have luxury rental cars. What else do you have? You have compact. Sometimes you have mid-size. Now, can you imagine if I bought a compact rental car and I go to the rental car place and I, I, I rented a, a, a compact and I go inside and then I look and I see that a, a, a big luxury vehicle. And I say, you know what? I start hitting that way. You know, the man's going to say, sir, sir, you asked for a compact. Am I right? <laughs> you pay for a compact. And he's going to point me not to a big vehicle. He's going to point me to the one that's what? Smaller. Compact means smaller. That you take something large and to compact it, you take something large and you make it what? You make it small. So a compacted prophecy takes a large prophecy and then puts it into something small. Let me ask you a question. If I took 7,000 years and condensed it into one year, would that be compact? That's exactly what happened in the sanctuary service. That every year, 
he showed us the history of 7,000 years from beginning to end. And we're going to show you this from the Bible. Now, my brothers and sisters, this shows us the first coming and the second coming of Christ in that one prophecy. And that's why God said when we go inside the sanctuary, we will understand it was a compacted prophecy of the gospel. A presentation in which were bound up the promises of what? Redemption. The plan of redemption is the picture. That's what we're looking at to put the Bible together and to understand all of the events that are taking place on this earth from the first to the last. And look at what this prophet says. It's all built on cycles of seven. The plan of redemption. Let's read this together from that book, Great Controversy, same book that you have, Great Controversy, page 659. Let's read it together. It says, for how long? 6,000 years. Satan's work of rebellion has made the earth to tremble. He had made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, and he opened not the house of his prisoners. How long did he keep them in that prison? Look what it says. For 6,000 years, his prison house has received God's people, and he would have held them captive forever. But what? But what? Christ had what? Broken his bonds and set the... Now, I want to ask you a question. What was this prison house that God's people had been put in by Satan for 6,000 years? Look at it carefully. I heard somebody say it. What was the prison house? It was what? The grave. Now, look what it says now. The kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, everyone in his own what? House. What is the house? What is the house? The grave. Now, you know, all the prophet is doing is quoting the book of Isaiah. She's quoting from Isaiah chapter 14. In fact, let's go there quickly. Isaiah 14, Heavenly Father, as we get ready to bring this message to a close, show us in these last few minutes, if ever there was a time to get ready, the time is now. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Look what the Bible says in Isaiah 14. What book did I say? We're going to Isaiah 14. Notice the prophet is just quoting from the book of Isaiah. You see, everything the prophet says, the Bible says. And everything this Bible says, this prophet says. Look at Isaiah 14. Look what it says in Isaiah 14, beginning in uh, uh, verse 18. Beginning in verse 18, look what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 14. Look what the Bible says in Isaiah 14. Look at what the Bible says. You're there, amen? Let's pick up in verse 17. Isaiah 14, 17. Isaiah 14, 17 says, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof that opened not the house of his what? Prisoners. Verse 18. All the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, every one in his own house. What are you talking about? What is this house? Verse 19. But thou art cast out of thy grave. What is this house that has held God's people? Talk to me, somebody. The grave. And do you notice what the prophet says? The prophet in this book says, the prophet says that he's only going to be able to hold them in the grave for how long? What is the limit of how long he's going to be able to hold them in the grave? What limit is that? Talk to me. 6,000 years. Then it says at the end of 6,000 years, Christ is going to break the bonds of the grave. Now, how does he do that? How does God break the bonds of the grave at the end of 6,000 years? At the second advent of Christ. What happens at the second advent of Christ? First Thessalonians says... In chapter 4, the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ shall do what? Rise first. Then we which are alive shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then it says, comfort one another with these words. Let me tell you something. If you have someone that has died recently in your life or your family, you don't have to be discouraged. It will not be long before they come out of that grave. Jesus is about to come. It's going to happen on time in this generation. It's not accidental you're here tonight. If we understood this, nothing will be more important than this. Not our jobs, not our school, not our work. Can you imagine? Parents get their children ready for school. People get ready for jobs, but yet we're not getting ready for the coming of Jesus. My brothers and sisters, what should a profit a man to gain the whole world and to lose his soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Nothing is more important than getting to know Jesus. Now, my brothers and sisters, the advent of Christ is going to come on time and break the bonds, and then we're going to be in heaven. But do you know the Bible tells us how long we're going to be in heaven? Go to Revelation. The Bible tells us, go to Revelation. We're closing in Revelation. Revelation 20. What book did I say? Revelation 20. Now, my brothers and sisters, look what the prophet says. This is the next paragraph. After telling us about the 6,000 years, the next paragraph says, For a thousand years, Satan will wander to and fro in the desolate earth to behold the results of his rebellion against the law of God. During this time, his sufferings are what? 
intense. Since his fall, his life of unceasing activity has banished what? I'm going to tell you something. Do you know that for a thousand years, God is going to give Satan a vacation? Do you know the brothers and sisters, from the time that Satan tempted Adam to sin, Satan has not once rested. And Satan himself does not know how much evil that he has done upon this world. He messed up everything. But guess what? During the thousand years, for the first time, he's going to stop. It's going to be like he's on retirement. Do you notice that when a man gets on retirement, they remember everything in their life from the beginning to the end. And many times they get frustrated. Do you know that for the first time, Satan is going to be on a retirement program and he's going to be frustrated. I did all of that, but it's going to be too late for him. Now, do you know that if we don't take time for reflection, we don't know how much we have hurt the heart of Jesus? Every morning and evening and day, we should stop and say, Lord, am I really getting closer to Jesus? Is what I'm doing bringing me closer to Jesus? Before you watch or listen or do anything, you need to make up in your mind, Lord, I don't want to do nothing that's going to stop me from having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, my brothers and sisters, now what does that mean? 6,000 plus 1,000 equals what? 7,000. At the end of this thousand year period, does the Bible speak of this, yes or no? In Revelation 20, the Bible speaks of this period. Revelation 20, are you there, amen? Beginning in verse 2, notice what the Bible says in Revelation 20 and verse 2. Let's read that together. The Bible says, and he laid hold on the, who is the dragon? Remember, that's a type, that's a shadow, that's a symbol. He had hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him, how long? A thousand years. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to ask you a question. This thousand year period, is this the first thousand years of human history or the last thousand years of human history? Are you sure? Now, most of the world doesn't understand this, but this is the last thousand years of human history. Go to Revelation 20. Let's see. Let's prove that. In Revelation 20, look at what it says in verse 7 and verse 6. Excuse me, verse 7. Revelation 20, verse 7. Verse 7 says, And when the thousand years were are what? In other words, when they're finished, Satan shall be loosed where? Out of his prison. What's going to happen? Verse 8. And he shall go out to deceive the nations. Look at verse 9. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and come past the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So the Bible says at the end of the thousand year period that the saints are going to be in the city and Satan and his hosts are going to surround the city and Jesus is going to put Satan and on fire and burn up sin and sinners and they're going to be no more. Am I right? Now, my brothers and sisters, what happens after hellfire takes place and sin and sinners are no more? Follow me now. What happens after that? Revelation 21. Look at Revelation 21. Revelation 21 says, in Revelation 21, after, the, uh, after sin and sinners are burnt up and the earth is burnt up, it says in verse 1, and I saw a what? New heaven and a new earth. Why? For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. So this is the last thousand years in human history. Amen. Now, I want to ask a question. People will say, how can you get this? But let me tell you something. If you study the Bible in context, there's only one answer you can give me. In the book of Revelation, the entire book is built on what number? Seven. How many candlesticks? Seven. How many churches? Seven. How many seals? Seven. How many trumpets? Seven. How many plagues? How many hairs does the beast have? Seven. Seven, seven, seven. And in each case, the seventh is never the first. The seventh is always the limit. It's always the last. Am I right? So if this is the last thousand-year period of human history, what thousand-year period must John the Revelator attach to stay in context with the entire book? What number? The seventh thousand-year period. We're going to go and prove that from the Bible. That this is the seventh thousand year. But remember now, that thousand year period, that happens in heaven. And at the end of that thousand year period, that's when he comes down. So my brothers and sisters, that means then that on earth, we don't have 7,000. If 1,000 of the seven is in heaven, then how much time do we have on earth? Talk to me, somebody. And when that 6,000 years happens, then he comes and resurrects at his second coming, the dead. So we have 6,000 years on earth. That means that the limit that we talked about yesterday is 6,000 years according to the Bible, according to the sanctuary. Now, the question would be, and I want to ask this question as we close. 
The question would have to be, where are you and I in 2024 in relationship to the 6,000-year period? Are you understanding what I'm telling you? Now, the thinking men, what do they say that the world's getting ready to collapse on? What time frame the world's going to collapse on? Now, wouldn't it be interesting if the thinking men that tell us that all this is going to collapse, the world, in 2030, wouldn't it be interesting if we go to the prophets and that 6,000 year lines up to that same time? Then, just as it was at the first coming of Christ, the wise men and the prophets agreed Christ came the first time. If it lines up again, then that means that Jesus Christ is getting ready to come the second. And I'm going to prove by the grace of God, it's going to line up. We are here. Now, do you know that what happens? We're going to prove this. Do you know there's a reason? Have you noticed now that it's getting hotter and the climate is changing? Have you noticed that you're seeing storms pick up, droughts pick up? I'm going to show you, brothers and sisters, it happens because something is going on in the sanctuary. Do you remember when I showed you that we said right now that a, a virus came and knocked off millions of people, but then we looked and it said that they're looking for another virus that said they could wipe out one billion people. I'm going to show you it's going to get worse than that. I'm going to show you that what we're looking at in this world history, tomorrow night, we're going to go a step farther and we're going to see in the sanctuary and all of this picture is going to become pictures. It's going to start making sense right before our very eyes. We're going to see the puzzle put together. We're putting the borders together right now. These are the limits. But then we're going to go into the inside and we're going to see, Lord, what's happening right now. And we're going to find out that Canada is going to have a great part of the picture of what's going to happen in these last days. Canada is going to join forces with the United States of America. Someone says, oh, no, not Canada. But if you study the history of Canada, it rose with the rise of America. It will collapse with the collapse of America. We're going to show you politically, listen, politically, we're going to show you that the Bible teaches, and we're going to show you, that before the Sunday law, the mark of the beast, the time of trouble, before the coming of the Lord, there's going to be a second civil war in the United States of America, politically. Then it's going to break into a worldwide revolution. We're going to show you socially that before the limit is reached of the 6,000 years, same-sex laws must rise because the last predominant social condition before a limit is reached is homosexuality in every nation. Do you know that in Babylon, before it reaches limit, homosexuality. And Medio Persia and Greece and Rome and Sodom and Gomorrah. And guess what? Before the world reaches the limit, we must see the same thing. We're going to prove this. Economically, we're going to show that the Bible teaches that there's going to be a complete, total economic collapse globally. And it's going to lead to chaos. It's going to lead to a time when no man can buy or sell. We're going to show you this on the Word of God. And guess what? It's getting ready to happen in just a few short months. And guess what's happening right now? 2024. We're going to show you tomorrow night. It's no ordinary year. Let's close in Luke 21. What book did I say? Luke 21. Look what the Bible says. We're going to show you 2020, 2024, no ordinary year. You know, at the end of this year, every over 4 billion people would have made elections for their countries. America is going to see the greatest crisis of an election year. It's happening now for a specific reason. The Bible says in Luke chapter 21, it says in verse 25, And there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars. And upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity in the sea and the waves roaring men's heart, failing them for fear, looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Verse 27 says, And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Verse 28, let's read that together. And when these things, what, begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads. Why? For your redemption. Draw an eye. This is the thing we need to be studying, this plan of redemption. And the Bible says in verse 31, So likewise, when you see all these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is not far away, but it is what? Nigh at hand. Verse 32, Verily I say unto you, what? This generation shall not pass to all be fulfilled. I'm telling you, this is the generation. You and I are living in that generation. And so what does the Bible say? Verse 36, Watch ye therefore and do what? Pray always. That you may be accounted to us, worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Brothers and sisters, 
I believe that if ever there was a time for us to be praying, it's right now. Lord, pray. Lord, I'm not worthy, but Jesus is worthy. Make me worthy. Give me this experience with Jesus so that I know him as a close, intimate, and personal friend. Is that your desire tonight? Praise God. If there's someone here tonight that says, Lord, I see what the Bible says. I see the signs. But I know that I don't have that closeness as I should yet. Lord, I, maybe I've accepted you before. Maybe I, I've tried. But Lord, I'm not in that intimate relationship yet. But I want it. I want to know you. If there's anyone here like that tonight, if all of us have that des- desire, would you reverently stand to your feet and say, Lord, I want to know Jesus. I want to know him as a close, as an intimate, as a personal friend. Praise God. Let us pray and close tonight. Heavenly Father. We're thankful for your love for us and that no matter how many sins that we have committed, you have made it possible tonight that if we come to Jesus because of that lamb, because of your death, because of your blood, because of salvation, redemption, that it is possible that, 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 that you ever live to make intercession for us and that you can save us to the uttermost if we come. And so, Lord, tonight we came, we come, and we ask that you will do something for us. We pray for those watching on the internet. We pray for those in this room that, that, Lord, you will help us to make a decision that nothing will stop us from sealing our commitment with Jesus tonight. And that we'll be here every night so that we can learn and get ready before it is too late. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated for a silent moment of meditation. Amen. Are you happy you're here tonight? Did you learn anything? Do you want some more? Tomorrow night, we're going further. What time? 6.59 and 30 seconds. Every night we get a little bit earlier. Amen. Because you're going to see that, that it's, it, can you, look how hard it is to, to crunch 7,000 years into one week. It takes some time. Amen. But by God's grace, we're going to do that. So please, let's pray for each other. Let nothing stop and keep you back from being here tomorrow night. What time? Uh, homework, homework, homework. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I can't be a good teacher. Homework. You didn't read Leviticus 23? Read it tonight. But I want you to add with that Leviticus 16. Uh, excuse me. Leviticus 23. I want you to zero in on Leviticus 23 verses 39 through 42. It's called the Feast of Tabernacles. Read about the Feast of Tabernacles. If you read it, it's going to make much sense tomorrow night. Amen? Please read that and then read Great Controversy, page 6. Now, I'm, 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 I'm going to lighten your homework. Read 399 through 401 again because I'm not sure you read it. Now, if you read it, then you can just brush yourself up on it. If you didn't read it, read it tonight so that tomorrow night I'm going to give you some fresh homework. But please look at the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of what? And then by God's grace, tomorrow night you'll understand. All right? With Leviticus 23, verses 29 through 44. It's the rest of the chapter. It's, that's what it's dealing with. That's the seventh feast. All right. By God's grace, this has been a blessing. You may now consider yourself dismissed as we get ready to leave this place. Let's leave it with a prayer for heart. Amen? May God bless. You may consider yourself dismissed. Thank you.